Welcome back. I'm speaking today with Genevieve West, who is a professor of English at Texas Women's University. She's also the chair of the Department of Language, Culture, and Gender Studies. And most importantly, she is the co-editor of the book, You Don't Know Us Negroes and Other Essays by Zora Neale Hurston, a collection of essays by that author that was recently found and published. And uh, we'll hear a little bit more about the origin of those essays. Good morning, Genevieve. You're in Texas. How are you? Hi, good morning. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, Charles. Thank you so much, uh, Genevieve, for speaking with me. I'm very excited to have this discussion with you. I guess my first question is uh, tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and specifically about the path that attracted you to uh, these essays by Zora Neale Hurston and uh, the, the path that brought you to edit this book. It's a long one. <laughs> um, I I read Hurston as an undergraduate student, I think like so many people do. Um, and this would have been in the very early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a while. Mm -hmm. And um, first read Hurston and, you know, enjoyed their eyes were watching God. But it was in graduate school when I was reading her autobiography, Dust Tracks on a Road, that I was really confronted with an enormous question for me. I came across two very different reviews of Their Eyes Were Watching God, one of them by Richard Wright. Um, he accused Hurston of minstrelsy in the novel mm -hmm. and said it carried no theme, no message, and no purpose. And on the other hand, I had Alice Walker, who had said that there was no book more important to her. And, you know, in the early 90s, Hurston was undergoing this renaissance. Um, American literary studies was in the midst of what we call the canon wars, where people were arguing about, you know, who goes in the canon, and if somebody goes in the canon, then you have to take somebody out. And, you know, there were all these very heated and contentious debates. And I was really perplexed by these two giants of African-American literary tradition having such very different responses to the novel. And so that was really the beginning of my work on Hurston. Um, I would go on to write my dissertation on Hurston. And um, my first book was on Hurston. It's um, Zora Neale Hurston and American Literary Culture, where I try to grapple with some of these processes of canon formation and why some why Hurston in particular um, was pushed out of the canon and then brought back into the canon at the time that she was. And so that was really kind of the beginning of my work on Hurston. Um, as I was working on that book, I was collecting book reviews around the country, and I was looking at a lot of obscure, kind of little used resources, and happened to come across a handful of Hurston's short stories that had never been cataloged. Um, they were undocumented in the scholarship. And I mentioned a couple of them in the book, and that would eventually lead to um, a meeting with Henry Louis Gates, who is himself a giant um, in African American cultural studies. And um, so that was really kind of the beginning of my work with him. Um, and that was, gosh, maybe 13, 12, 13 years ago. Wow. Um, yeah. So it has been in gestation <clears throat> this entire time. It has. Um, it was a book that he intended to do in the 90s. And then life got busy and other projects got in the way and it didn't happen. Um, and so I, um, I edited uh, Hitting a Straight Lick with a Crooked Stick, which came out two years ago. And it's a collection of Hurston's short stories that includes um, more than half dozen short stories that were undocumented um, at one point or another. And so that provided an opportunity for me to talk to Dr. Gates some more. And we worked on this volume of, of essays together. Um, we have spent close to a decade trying to track down everything and um, try to get a good sense of um, what was out there, particularly things that were unpublished um, and maybe sitting in archives. So that, 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 I guess that's my next question is wh where were these essays? They were found in, in different sources and different archives. Yeah. They were, all, were they all in one place with family members or how, how did you source these different 
these different isomers. I wish they'd all been in one place. That would have made things <laughs> so made much easier. easier. Yes, we would, have, we would have done the book a long time ago. Because Hurston traveled back and forth from Florida to New York quite a bit, mm -hmm. um, we know there are things that were lost. There was a point where she was traveling from Florida to Jack or from New York to Jacksonville, and she got off the train and her trunk was gone. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a time when you know people traveled with a steamer trunk, essentially, mm -hmm. and the trunk had her papers in it. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so a lot of things disappeared at that point. Sorry to interrupt, but you, so you think some of the essays in uh, in this collection were from that trunk, or no? They're there. We don't know what happened forever. to them. Yeah. So these are a lot of the things in the book have actually been published, and some of them have been anthologized quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But what makes the book unique is that we have found things that were in archives around the country. Um, I think one of the essays that you probably want to talk about is The Lost Keys of Glory. Mm -hmm. And um, it was in another writer's papers at Columbia University. So Hurston had apparently you know, typed up this essay and sent it to someone else and she put it in her files and there it stayed until we happened to, to find it. And so now it's in the book. Incredible. Uh, and so uh, in terms of the challenges uh, around uh, editing this collection, obviously the sourcing of it was very difficult. I, I imagine there would have been a great number of essays and you really had to prioritize or did you include everything that you found or how was the mm -hmm sorting process and was that challenging or surprising in any way you know there's there's more than enough of hurston's work to have done two volumes mm -hmm. um but a lot of it is widely available mm -hmm. um or of or of interest probably to very particular academic audiences mm -hmm. and so i think hurston's family and the press wanted to do something that would attract a wide audience Mm -hmm. um, and still be affordable, frankly, right. um, because, you know, a two volume set could get quite expensive. Um, and so we wanted to keep it manageable for people. Mm -hmm. um, so the volume includes the things that are, we think, most important mm -hmm. um, and most likely to be of interest to the most people. Understood. OK. And so wh which of these essays slash articles, I suppose, I mean, some of them would have been, could be considered a form of journalism. Uh, which of those most resonated with you personally, uh, which do you think are, are most emblematic of her writing or her viewpoints? And, 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 I, and then I've got a follow up question, but I'll let you answer that, that one now. Okay, I, I think for me, the thing that was most interesting is the title essay, You Don't Know Us Negroes. Mm -hmm. And it was one that wasn't published. It was slated to be published in American Mercury mm -hmm. and was actually typeset. And that's where we found it was in the papers of the American Mercury, but it was never printed. And we don't know why um, it, you know, in kind of bold crayon at the top, almost it says kill. And we don't know why. We don't know why it didn't make it into print. Um, but it's a it's a great essay, and I think it really speaks to Hurston's intentions and her goals as a writer. And um, there are some critiques there of trends in American literature, and I, I think it's a really really important essay in terms of establishing Hurston's her intent, her purpose as a writer. Mm -hmm. and, and I think setting the tone for that uh, cultural uh, showcasing of, of Black culture in America, I, I thought it was a very powerful essay. On the other end of the spectrum, I've got to be honest with you, there, there were some essays which I struggled with somewhat, uh, including the more uh, budgetary-minded essays around, uh, I think it was Howard University or... Uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and that felt a little bit drier and a little bit more administrative. What, what, what was the thinking behind including something like that? There have been a lot of people who have argued that Hurston was apolitical, 
right, that she wasn't engaged in or interested in the politics of her time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a good example of an essay where you see her taking on a political issue. And it was it was the politics of, of Howard University. Mm -hmm. And as a former student, she, it was near and dear to her heart. Um, and so for us, it was important to include for that reason. Mm -hmm. Understood. So, I mean, you, you say she may be not seen as political. I was very surprised, uh, and I, I would expect a, a lot of readers of this collection of essays would be very surprised at some of the quite conservative viewpoints that emerge from uh, these essays. I mean, first and foremost, I think the essay on feminism uh, is probably one that might be most shocking to people uh, coming from a woman. And uh, we'll, we'll discuss that in a second. And then there's also a pretty clear taking of sides in a debate, which I admit I don't understand very well because I'm not American and it's, it's not something that I brought up with. But uh, her, I wouldn't say attack, but her clear distaste, let's say, for W.E.B. Dubois and his policies, and that's not necessarily something that one might expect from a, a writer like her. Uh, she also writes an essay that's not very friendly, in fact, frankly, attacking Marcus Garvey, who's closely associated with Rastafarianism. So tell us a little bit more about that quite conservative viewpoint, is that a reason for her disappearance from the canon at some point? Is that linked to that or, or not at all? Sorry, I'm adding a lot of questions I, it's, here. Yeah, it's difficult. Time. It's. I think that her reason for disappearing from the canon had less to do with what we think about as politics and more to do with the politics of art. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, was really kind of underneath a lot of her disagreements with W.E.B. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a real clear fracture in uh, the Harlem Renaissance among the writers about, you know, how do we portray African Americans in art? And, you know, what's the purpose of art? And so you have Hurston kind of siding with for lack of a better term, the younger writers of the period. So Langston Hughes and Wallace Thurman, who were very clearly pushing the boundaries of what art could do and what it should do, as opposed to the more senior figures like W.E.B. Du Bois, who very explicitly saw art as a form of propaganda. And the younger writers really pushed back against the idea that art should be propagandistic. They wanted to, to create art that spoke to the African-American experience rather than feeling like they had to create art that put forward what they would have considered a, a false or limited view of African-American life. You know, so for Hurston, having grown up in, in rural Florida, the folk characters she writes about, those are the people that she knew. Those are the people in her community. Whereas W.E.B. Du Bois, who grew up in, you know, Massachusetts, had a very different experience with community and Black community. The challenge was that particularly among white readers, there was a lot of stereotyping. And so people would look at Hurston's characters and say, that's the Negro, as if there is only one, right? And so you get this real tension about, you know, how, how do we deal with stereotypes? How do we respond to this? And so Du Bois took that very um, conservative, they call it better foot foremost, right? Put your best foot first forward. Um, but the, the younger writers were not, not so concerned about that. So there, there was this very clear fracture among the Harlem Renaissance writers. Now, Hurston's social politics are very conservative. She was not a big fan of the New Deal in spite of the fact that she worked as part of the Works Progress Administration and she benefited from that process. Um, she was also very, very um, skeptical of socialism and communism, and you see those views come out in some of these essays. And so, you know, I think it's one of the things I most appreciate about Hurston is she's so multidimensional. Mm -hmm. um, she is conservative in some ways, but very liberal in others. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, feminism is its whole other whole other complex. Uh, conversation that I think you want to have. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. So in terms of, of these multiple dimensions, uh, what do you see as being her impact on, let's say, artists or on social viewpoints? How, how do you see uh, the evolution of that influence? You, you mentioned earlier in the conversation, Alice Walker, who I think is a clear, there's a clear line between uh, Zora Neale Hurston and Alice Walker. So what, what, what's her impact? What, what path did she, did she open up? How did she influence the, the arts and other social viewpoints? Yeah, I think she, she was implicitly in her fiction and then more explicitly in the essays, making the argument that the lives of everyday people are worthy of artistic representation. Mm -hmm. That just because you didn't go to college doesn't mean that that your life, your culture, your traditions are things that you should be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And she was very proud of that history. She was really proud of the creativity and the, the expression that that grew out of those folk communities. And you see that in her plays and her short stories and her her even in her essays where she captures sometimes the voices of the folk on the page. And so her impact is so multifaceted, just as she was, because one, there's the dep depiction of these particular kind of blue collar working class characters, but in very positive ways. Um, there are no apologies for who they are. They just are, and they're fabulous, and they're, they're multidimensional, just like everybody else. They have um, strengths and weaknesses, just like human beings do. Um, so there's that that depiction, but then there's also the way that she captures the speech on the page. Um, dialect coming into the early part of the 20th century was really more um, almost a mutilation mm. of of what we might call you know standard English. Mm. Um, if you've ever read Charles W. Chestnut, there's some early dialect there, and it's very very difficult to read um, because it, it doesn't it doesn't read on the page you can say the word out loud and you still can't hear it with Hurston's um, vernacular it's not just like the changing of spelling or the dropping off of a final consonant it's the idiom and she talked about this as stewing the subject in its own juice mm -hmm. so um, she's not just capturing like the way a word is pronounced, she's capturing the way that sentences are put together and the way the voice actually sounds so that the ear can actually hear mm -hmm. like what what appears on the page. And I think that's a really, really important um, contribution to American literary studies. Um, but then there's also the anthropological work that she did that was profoundly influential, um, where she begins to incorporate fiction writing techniques in her anthropology and folklore collection. Um, but then she also takes that folklore collection and she blends that into the fiction. And so, you know, all of these various parts of, of her identity are feeding one another, but they're also making tremendous contributions to the traditions of ethnography and folklore that that we face today and you know, people are still talking about what Hurston did in Mules and Men and Tell My Horse as groundbreaking and that I think that says something that you know here we are 60 years later and and we're still talking about that work as groundbreaking Mm -hmm. So, so was she a pioneer coming back to, to the language and the use of vernacular, which is something that's quite prominent, actually, in, in her work. I, to, be, to be fair, I've only read this collection of essays and Their Eyes Were Watching God. But from Their Eyes Were Watching God, I remember very clearly this, this very strong vernacular that's almost a character in and of itself in the book. Absolutely. Uh, was, she, was she a pioneer in, in, in making that vernacular more accessible to people? Yes. Like some of her predecessors? Absolutely. And, you know, she argued that her work moved from dialect into vernacular. Mm -hmm. um, dialect had this real negative connotation attached to it that went back to stereotypes, that it was the, the language of minstrelsy. It mm -hmm. was, you know, um, 
a kind of step and fetch it. I don't know if you're familiar with those characters um, from American radio, but you know, they're very, very stereotypical kind of buffoon like characters. Mm -hmm. And um, that was that was what people thought about when they thought about dialect. And so, you know, Hurston's challenge was to try, I've argued, to, to reclaim that dialect, um, to reclaim the vernacular, the everyday idiom, the speech of the average person that she knew, a, a segment of the Black population, um, to reclaim that and, and pull it back from minstrelsy and stereotype and create something authentic with it. Mm -hmm. What, what, what do you think, very broad question, and what, what do you think of uh, that, that Zora Neale Hurston would make of contemporary culture in America, of contemporary Black culture in America? What, what aspects do you think she would connect with and what aspects do you think she would not connect with? Now that's a tough question to answer because she was so complicated. So there are things that... <clears throat> Like, I think she would, she would be frustrated that like, you know, feminism and gender issues are not further advanced. Mm -hmm. um, I can also see her out marching in the streets for Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, as she became in some ways uh, more openly frustrated with racial politics as she got older. And you see that, especially in her letters. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, okay, and so I do have a question about, uh, you know, the, the fact that she, if, if I remember her biography correctly, she, she essentially disappeared at, at one point and, and really went back to Florida and was, was doing quite menial jobs. W what essentially happened there? I mean, wh where did this uh, dip in her career come from? Was it, what was it due to? I think that there were a couple of things happening. Um, her last novel came out in 1948. Unfortunately, it was the same year that she was accused of child molestation. Uh -huh. And that was, I think, probably one of the most devastating things that ever happened to her. And she didn't have an easy life. Um, but uh, a former landlady accused her of molesting a, a, a young man who was disabled. Mm -hmm. And um, because there was a minor involved, it was supposed to have been confidential. And uh, a, an African-American person working in the court leaked it to the Black papers. And there are these horrible, lurid, like three inch headlines that appeared in the newspapers about, you know, Zora accused. And it's like, it was just horrible. It was just about as bad as you can, can imagine. Um, and, you know, eventually the case was thrown out of court. She um, was out of the country. Uh, yeah, out, out of the country at the, at the time that, you know, some of this was supposed to have happened. Um, but it left her emotionally, financially depleted. And, um, you know, she racked up a, a considerable a debt with the, the attorney who was defending her. Um, none of her books ever sold more than 600 copies in her lifetime. And so she struggled to make a living as a writer. And during the 40s, she was largely doing that with her essays. And so I think that's, that's kind of how she was paying her bills. But she lived on the verge of poverty most of her life, which is really devastating when you think about her stature today. So she um, would be amazed to, to find out her, her impact and her success and, and the publication of these essays, uh, she'd be the first to be quite surprised, one might imagine. I, I think very gratified. Um, yeah. yeah. But, you know, she, she retired to Florida and, you know, took a job as a housekeeper at one point, um, as you say, to, to just kind of keep body and soul together. But, you know, writing is a it takes creative energy. Mm -hmm. And um, I think at that point, she was so depleted. She, she literally needed to just put a roof over her head and feed herself for a while. And so she did take other kinds of work. She worked as a librarian for a while. Um, she wrote other novels, mm -hmm. um, one of which uh, 
should be coming out in the next year or so. I think maybe in January. Um, it's the last novel that we have. Mm -hmm. um, but there was one called Mrs. Doctor that she couldn't sell that was about a female physician. Um, there was one about Barney Turk. So there are at least two book link manuscripts that have disappeared. Mm -hmm. We don't know where those are. I would love it if they turned up somewhere, but right uh, now we don't have we're them. We're counting on you. We're counting on <laughs> you. <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of uh, the, your future projects, so is there a second volume that you're working on at this stage, or are there other Not right now. elements no. of uh, her work that you're interested in, in showcasing based on things you've discovered through these essays, or what, what's there next are... for you in terms of your next book projects? Yeah, um, I don't know yet what the next book project is. It might take me in a pretty different direction. Um, I am still thinking about um, Hurston and her um, preacher figures. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking about um, preachers in the Harlem Renaissance. So that's kind of one, one train of thought there. And then another one um, takes me uh, in a very different direction and working on one of her contemporaries. Uh, Marita Bonner was um, in some ways Hurston's almost dialect opposite oh, wow. um, in the sense that she um, graduated from a very good high school in Boston. She went to um, Radcliffe, which was the women's division of Harvard, and um, had a very good education, was very much kind of that uh, upper middle class progressive new Negro mm -hmm. in the way that Hurston was not. Mm -hmm. okay. And so I'm starting to think about her work quite a bit as well. Okay, fascinating. Well, we all certainly look forward to, to that and to future projects that you may be involved in. Genevieve, thank you so much uh, for your time today. I really appreciate it. And it was fascinating to find out more about this really fascinating subject and uh, hopefully uh, entice more people to uh, read your, buy your book, read your book, or, or um, rather her book, the book that you Her read, book, her, yes. Her book. And again, a, a really a great pleasure to, to speak to you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.